Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the final Humanities Forum of the semester. My name is Raymond Hain. I'm the director of the forum and a member of the philosophy department here at Providence College. Uh, like many of our events, today's event is integrated into the DWC schedule, and I expect that many of you are thinking about early Christianity uh, right now as you come to the end of your semester. Thank you especially for being with us on the last day of the semester before exams. Uh, and let me especially remind you, too, uh, afterwards, as usual, we'll have a reception in the great room just down the hall. Please come and join us to continue the conversation. Now, if you would, please welcome to the podium uh, my colleague, Jim Janicek, who's a member of the Art and Art History Department here at PC, to introduce our distinguished guests. I'm Jim Janicek. I'm part of Raymond's Humanities Forum, and as he said, I teach in the Art and Art History Program, uh, Department, excuse me. Um, you know from the message that we sent to the campus that uh, Dr. Jensen is uh, widely published and has a number of opinions on early Christian art and iconography. The book that made a difference for me in identifying her thoughts is called The Cross, and you can see the subject of today's discussion. Um, in this case, um, she's identified a very controversial, it's her term, um, a, appraisal of the history of early Christian uh, thought on the cross from not mentioning it all in Paul's letters to mentioning it all the time 1,200 years later, which is approximately um, what I'm talking about. Sure. The, um, that's all right. So what we're talking about here is a visual history because she's very literate visually and textually. And what she has identified is a, not necessarily a conflict, but a tension between how things are viewed and how things are written. And I really found this book uh, especially interesting. I wanna make just a final note before Dr. Jensen begins her speech her uh, talk with us. And that is what I detected in her writing is what you might call a working definition of creativity. She identified a problem, she did her research, she investigated it, and she came up with something that is special to her, herself, a new world view. And that to me is uh, an especially distinguishing uh, way to write. So I'm looking forward to a lively conversational discussion. And without further ado, I welcome Dr. Robin Jensen. Thank you so much for this invitation. It's just wonderful to be here. And I'm really impressed that you're here on the day before finals as well. So I have promised that I'm not going to use a text. I'm going to just talk. And so this will be very informal and conversational. And so I, I hope that that all works. Um, I'm opening up this uh, lecture with this beautiful crucifix that's in the Metropolitan Museum Cloisters in New York. And that's going to set a tone for the next slide or two. This is actually, um, these are two images of crucifixes, or one a cross and one a crucifix. At Notre Dame, we have what we call a crucifix initiative running right now, which is to, uh, intended to replace our mass-produced, I guess I could say, crucifixes with artists-made crucifixes. Now, if you have any idea the size of our, class, our, our campus and the number of classrooms and offices, that would be probably thousands <laughs> of crucifixes. But what we want to do is take this kind of crucifix that's on the left and, and change it out for something that's more uh, artist-made. On the right is something that also brings up another issue for me, which is our Bisbee crucifix, which is in our Nativic Hall, <clears throat> and it's made of nails. Now, it's actually not a crucifix, is it? It's a cross. 
Um, you have to work hard to see any kind of body in, on that image, which raises another kind of question, and one that I raised in our discussion about the crucifix initiative. Are we talking about crucifixes, or are we talking about crosses? And what would be the difference between those two things? And this is exactly the problem I ran into when I began to work on the book uh, The Cross for Harvard Press many years ago now, um, when they asked me to write a book on the cross, and they didn't seem to realize that there was a difference between a cross and a crucifix. And so I had to explain to them that I couldn't possibly write a book only on the cross, because I would have to write a book also on the crucifix. So this is going to be part of the thinking of this discussion. And maybe many of you realize that that's actually at the heart of that question is sometimes also the problem between Catholics and Protestants about what we put on the walls of our churches or our offices or our homes. Um, do we have crucifixes or crosses? So that is going to be something I want us, us to think about. And I want us to think about what the evolution of this is. So I'm going to give you a couple of quotations. These are quotations I'm giving to you because I'm going to trouble them. <laughs> I'm going to inter investigate or interrogate these two comments. Um, one of the things that is not very well known to most people is when we think of the crucifix, especially the crucifix and or the cross, but the crucifix in particular, people don't realize that we did not have one of those images, or at least not a surviving one, before about the beginning of the fifth century. So this is what we think of as the most ubiquitous and, and central Christian image, especially for Catholics, is that this did not exist at the beginning. And that is something that other art, scholars have noticed or authors have noticed, and this is what they've commented. So on the back of a blurb of a book called Saving Paradise by two women, uh, both feminist authors, Rita Nakashima Brock and Rebecca Parker, this is what they say. During the first millennium, Christians filled their sanctuaries with images of Christ as a living presence in a vibrant world. He appears as a shepherd, a teacher, a healer, an infant, a youth, and a bearded elder but he is never dead. Once Jesus began to be depicted as, a crucify, as crucified, dying was virtually all he seemed to do. How did an early vision of beauty evolve into one of torture? Okay, and then a rather quite a bit older, a hundred years older if you want, quotation from D.H. Lawrence. A small thing was the resurrection compared with the cross and the death. Surely the passage of the cross and the tomb was forgotten. Ah, but no, always the memory of the wounds, always the smell of the grave clothes. Alas, that the memory of the passion of sorrow and death and the grave holds triumph over the pale fact of the resurrection. Okay, and so what I did give you was an image of the resurrected Christ here to go with that. So I want to think about those two comments because they're both in some sense, in a small sense, kind of right, but in a very large sense, missing something very important. But let me show you where they're kind of right. So for Christian art began, as far as we know, to be identifiably Christian, not before the beginning of the third century. So we have around 200, 200 to 225, the emergence of, 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 Im, of pictorial art, figurative art, that we can say is definably Christian. Up until then, we don't have any at least remains of such very much. And for the next 100 years or so, mostly what we, maybe 150 years even, mostly all we have are biblical images, narrative images, Old Testament figures like Adam and Eve and Daniel and the three youths in the fiery furnace, if you know those stories. My students don't always, but the Old Testament stories. And also images of Jesus as a healer, as a teacher, as a miracle worker. But not as Jesus, as an infant in his mother's arms, much. And almost no image of Jesus undergoing his passion not being tried, not being tortured, not being crowned with thorns, not being carrying off his cross to, the, to Golgotha. 
not until the, toward the end of the fourth century, and really not until the beginning of the fifth. But we do have these images of Jesus from the catacombs in Rome, healing the woman with the issue of blood, or multiplying uh, baskets of bread. And here is a couple of, we call early Christian sarcophagi. These are big marble coffins that people were buried in. And they had images carved on them. Obviously, very wealthy people could afford this. And you see the mix of Old Testament and New Testament images. On the, very, on the upper one, you see Lazarus being raised by Jesus from his tomb, as in the Gospel of John. I know it looks like a mummy coming out of a tomb, but that's what it is. And we see Adam and Eve, and we see Jesus blessing the loaves and fishes to multiply them to feed the multitude. And then you have um, over here on the right is on the upper right is Jesus healing the man with the, the crippled man who came with his bed to the pool. And below is some of the same kinds of images. And you can see the man born blind who is being healed by Jesus. There's the wedding at Cana scene. Here, and so forth. That's what we have. We don't have a crucifix. We don't have any references to Jesus' suffering. We only have images of Jesus as a healer and a miracle worker. So in that sense, Lawrence and Parker and Brock are not wrong. But we do have some crosses. And they come up pretty early. They may be even third century. So we have some crosses. And this one's kind of wonderful because it has the word uh, for the fish on it, as you can sort of imagine, I can go through that. But we have that ring. We also have some hieroglyphic kinds of crosses that were in papyri, in the m maybe even as late as the second century, as early as the second century, in which we have a figure of Greek letter rho intersected by a tau, which looks a little like a head on a cross of a man. And it's in the word for cross the Greek word staros. And there are a few others, really fairly rare. But we also have this wonderful, and I want you to see something like this again in a minute. This is an anchor with us hooking two fish. And the anchor is in some ways a cross. It may be an early cross symbol, a cross reference. And finally, we have a few, very rare, about as many as uh, about four or five, images of crucifixion on also on gems. Now, we're not absolutely certain of the date of these. They're probably third, but they're, I think they may be later. They could be fourth century. And they tend to be, we're not even sure they're Christian altogether. But this one probably is. So you see an image of a man standing in this position, not hanging, with 12 little alien-looking creatures below him. I mean, they're kind of funny. They sort of don't have any features. They're sort of looking a little bald and strange. And um, they're quite small, and everybody's kind of standing. And we have the letters of the word, Greek word for fish above its head, and that is the ac uh, acrostic for Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. The four, I mean, sorry, the five letters that make up that word for fish, but it is actually an acrostic that is all the titles of Jesus. So that probably is some little handful of images that we have of crosses and maybe crucifixion scenes before the fifth century. And then we get this one. So this is a very small, I tried to give you in inches the dimensions of this object, of, of each panel. It's a four little ivory plaques, about, about this big, and it made the sides of a reliquary box, possibly a box to hold the consecrated Eucharist, possibly the relics of a saint. And it's now in the British Museum. Probably came from Rome, maybe Milan. And it has these four scenes. And this is the oldest surviving example of a crucifix we have, and it's dated to around, four, um, excuse me, around 420 to 430, okay? Think how long that took, and think how small this is, but also look at how wonderful it is. <laughs> so on the upper left, you see Jesus carrying a cross, 
away from Pilate, who's washing his hands, and you see also Peter in his denial. So it's a mixing of those two narratives from the story of Jesus' passion. And there's the maidservant accusing Peter of being a friend of Jesus with the rooster and so forth. And you get that whole scene. And then down below it is the first scene that we have of the crucifixion. I'll come back to that in a minute. On the upper right is the earliest example I believe we have of the resurrection. There is the empty tomb. And below that one, on the lower right, is the scene of the doubting Thomas. So it's a post-resurrection image. They're gorgeous, small ivories. But here is, the, here is our oldest crucifix scene. And this one is pretty amazing because if you look at it carefully, you see Jesus is not suffering. He's not dying. He's not even being tortured except that the figure on the right is, would have been holding a spear that got broken off and reaching into his side to plunge the spear. But this Jesus is robust. He's alive. His eyes are open on the cross. He's practically jumping off of it. And he's looking straight out. He's not showing any signs of, of grief. He do, does have ha nails in his hands holding him on that cross. He's elevated from it. And, the, and the, the, the mother of Jesus, the Virgin Mary, and the beloved disciple are below. And then to creating a wonderful contrast with this living Jesus on the cross is the dead Judas hanging from the tree. And Judas is, a, is hanging, his feet are dangling, and below his feet you can see the bag of money spilling out. And it looks as if also coming out of that bag of money is a serpent. That's kind of wonderful. So we have possibly an echo of the story of Adam and Eve in there as well. Above Jesus' head, of course, is the title, the King of the Jews, the one that is in the Gospel of Matthew, I think, is given by Pilate, but it's, it's given altogether as the accusation of what he claimed to be. So the next one we have, just a little after that, and then nothing again until a middle of the 6th century, so it takes 100 years before we get more, is this one. And this is in a quite small, also, small wooden panel on the door of a basilica in Rome. It's actually a Dominican church. <laughs> I'm looking over here at my friends. Um, you know it's the Santa Sabina in Rome. And on the door, in the wooden door, is there is a beautiful panel of the crucifixion which is up in the upper right, and you have to work very hard to get a look at it and work very even harder to get a good photo of it, which is sort of why this is not so great. This is my photo. Um, but I often used to laugh. I used to teach in Nashville, Tennessee. And I used to say, this looks a little like the line dance at the Crazy Horse Saloon to me. Um, because these guys are sort of like, they're doing this kind of like sidestep, you know, when, you know, anyway. There's not much suffering going on here either. Or we probably have Jesus and the two thieves. But nobody is hanging, nobody is sagging, nobody is suffering in this image. So, what does all this mean? Sometime in the middle of the fourth century, we get, actually, our first clearly Christian cross. And this is the one I would point to. This is Jesus holding a cross and if you look at it carefully, you'll notice that cross has gems on it. It's a gemmed cross. It's not the old rugged cross of the Methodist hymn my father used to sing. It wouldn't hold anybody's body. It's probably meant to initially to have been, look like gold and gemmed. It's a scepter. It's a sign of his triumph. It's a sign of his conquest. And so we have Jesus holding this cross like a king would hold a scepter or a general would hold a, a, a standard in war. On the left is Peter being carried off to martyrdom, and on the right is Jesus again being brought before Pilate. Now we can talk later about why Jesus looks the way Jesus looks. If you'll notice, it's another whole lecture. He doesn't have a beard and he has long curly hair, and that's another story. But that is, you have to trust me, that's Jesus. And below Jesus, and those two smaller figures are Peter and Paul. And this occurs over and over again. Um, 
as in this gla beautiful glass pattern, oh, sorry, to hold the Eucharist in the, in the, in the ritual of the, of the sacrament. And there's a drawing of it. So we kind of get the sense of the same uh, composition. And again, here in another sarcophagus that's in the Vatican um, Basilica, the crypt below the, the St. Peter's Basilica. Now, much to say about all of those images, but I want you to concentrate on the fact that here Jesus is holding a narrow, golden, gemmed cross. And then something really interesting happens around the last half to maybe the last quarter of the fourth century, probably about the same time that we're beginning to see these, we start to get what we call passion sarcophagi. These are a handful of, of these kinds of big monumental marble coffins that have not a crucifix, but we see the first uh, allusions to the passion story. So on the left is Simon carrying the cross with the Roman soldier nudging him forward. In the center left is a Roman soldier crowning Jesus but not with a crown of thorns. That is not a crown of thorns, that's a crown of laurel. That's a victor's crown. And on the right are two images of Jesus coming before Pilate again. Pilate gets a lot of play in Roman art. It's kind of interesting. Pilate becomes a saint down the road, and that's another story. But we have Jesus before Pilate who's washing his hands, and then in the center, where you might think you would find a crucifix, you find an empty cross. Now, that's not just an empty cross. That is a cross that has a wreath surmounted on it. And I bet somebody knows what that sign in the middle is. It's a Cairo. And that's the first two letters of the title, Christos, right? So this is the Cairo. And we just talked about it a little bit in that starogram that I showed you very fast a little while ago. And there we have, in a victory wreath, this, this Cairo, this monogram of Jesus. And on the crossbars of the cross are two doves, pecking at berries in the wreath. And down below the arms of the cross are two, again, Roman soldiers. One of them seemingly sleeping and the other one looking upwards. So that is not a reference to the crucifixion. Now we have the empty cross. But it's not, and it's an empty cross with, an, with a reference to the resurrection, right? Because we have the two sleeping guards who are sleeping at the door of the tomb, those Roman soldiers. So here we have a victory symbol. Um, I'm sorry, a, a symbol, it's a Cairo. I'm going to get but to tell you that's a victory symbol. And this is a symbol of resurrection. Now, how did that happen? How did that Cairo get to be a symbol of resurrection? That monogram did not, so far as I can say, there are people who might disagree, but I think they're wrong. We don't have any evidence of that monogram before the beginning of the fourth century. So I'll just look at it again as a close-up. And here's another instance of it. You have to imagine the Cairo got missing. And here are the processing apostles venerating it. And then it appears over and over and over again on people's tombstones. This is where it appears in Christian art. It's in a funerary context. It's on a sarcophagus. It's on a funerary plaque. And it's on all kinds of references that you might find to death. But where did it come from? Well, it came from the Emperor Constantine to begin with. So here is, I know these aren't old, these are not early Christian paintings, but this is the story. So I can give you the story very quickly, but I might just summarize it. And here it all is in some ways. There's two versions, or maybe three versions of this. They're a little bit different from each other. But basically, the Emperor Constantine, Roman Emperor, the first emperor to supposedly convert to Christianity. What made him convert? Well, he was a little worried about a battle he was about to go into with another, another uh, ruling emperor around Rome. And he was himself a little, he, his mother might have been a Christian, his father maybe even was, we're not sure. He was also a devotee of the god Apollo, we know that, or Saul Invictus. 
And he probably, at this point, knew about Christianity, because there were certainly some of them around, and he decided that he might just pray to the Christian God to see if he could get some help in this war to come, battle to come. And he had a vision. Either he had a vision at the noonday or it, in his sleep. But anyway, he was told in this vision to put this sign on the shields and, and helmets and standards of his soldiers, and he would win every battle. And that sign was the Cairo, was this Greek, looks like a P, a Greek row intersected by a chi, which looks like an X, and that's what we call the Christogram, or the Cairo symbol. Constantine put this on the shields and the helmets of his soldiers. He wore it in his own helmet, and lo and behold, he won every battle, supposedly, that he carried into with this thing. So we have this showing up everywhere on coinage of Constantine, and this is kind of wonderful. You can see it actually piercing again the serpent. That's Constantine's head on the obverse side of a coin. And we have it throughout his son's reigns. He, they put it, it's always in a military con context. It is never in a religious context. It's always a military symbol. Well, what does it mean? It means victory. It means I win. It means I conquered. Well, if I put it on my tomb, what does it mean? I conquered death. So now, what was a victory symbol of an emperor, a military victory symbol, becomes the symbol of Christ's conquest over death, and of course, individual's conquest over death in the resurrection promised to the faithful. And it's a transition that's made with a cross in the middle of it. That is the early Christian understanding of what crucifixion means. It's victory. It's Christos victor, we often say, and it comes immediately from Paul. So if we look at the New Testament epistles, even perhaps, even the Gospel of John, you're going to come to this in a minute, we have so many references to the crucifixion, but not the crucifixion as something that was a punishment or a suffering, but a crucifixion that was a powerful symbol against the enemies of, of the faith. So Paul says, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. Or we proclaim Christ crucified to those, uh, to a, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to emperors, but those who are called Jews and Greeks alike. It's the power of God and the wisdom of God. I like this text from Colossians. And when you were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him when he forgave us all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us with its legal demands. He set this aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example, triumphing over them. Okay, that's the triumph of the cross. That's what happens. And this one, remember our favorite image again. I come right back to John. I lay down my life in order to take it up again, and I have the power to take it up again. That's the message that we're getting in this early imaging of the cross. And so when we have Christ on the cross here, not dying, not suffering, but in fact living and victorious and proud, that, that's the image we get for the early Christian crucifix. And that's where I think these two authors I was quoting at the beginning I got it wrong. This is not just about death and torture. This is about what death undoes. This death undoes death. This death undoes sin, but it also undoes death. And so throughout um, our thinking about these things, we get this sort of image. And I'm not going to read you all of these texts because it'll take us too long because I want to get through some more. But this is the image of the gemmed cross. And you notice on this gemmed cross, which is a 6th century mosaic from near Ravenna in Santa Polinari in Classe, but I love it. It's on the cover of my book, actually. Um, we have the head of Jesus encircled with pearls on a gemmed cross on a night sky. And this is the sign of his second coming but we don't have a corpus on that cross. This one is also a wonderful text from another fourth century Greek father, 
and you can sort of quickly read it, but it talks about the fact that Jesus was like the baited fish hook and the devil snatched it and, of course, got caught. And so, therefore, he overtook the devil in a kind of trickery way. And I love the fact that we get so many images of fish and hooks in early Christianity. And this one on the left is a, thir is a early fourth or late third century tombstone. It's in Rome. And it's for a woman named Licinia Amias. Um, that's her name below. And the what it says, you see that again? You see that word for fish, that, uh, that acrostic that I told you about, that yoda, chi, theta, uh, upsilon, and sigma, um, that looks like an ichthus or a funny little ix. That says the cross of the living, I mean the fish of the living ones. So we're talking about life. If I'm going to put something on my tomb, I want to talk about my life. I want to talk about my afterlife, the resurrection from my death. And that's what we're seeing here. Now, moving ahead, the next time we see the cross, we begin to see narrative images of the crucifixion in this way. This is dated to around 586. Some arguments about the dating of this, but um, here we have, it's a page from a, a Syriac gospel, so it comes from Syria, and we have what is possibly our oldest painted image of the crucifix, and here we have Jesus, and I gave you the d detail of it. He looks a little sad, but he does, or a little disappointed, I would say, more than sad. And he's um, on the cross, but again, he's not dying. His eyes are open, he's looking down, he's perfectly erect, and he's also wearing a purple robe with golden stripes. And that was supposed to have been given to him in the story, you know, when they were mocking him, they dressed him up like a ruler, but they apparently took it off because we do think that Jesus was probably crucified in nothing more than a loincloth. But this is an indication of already his regnant, his regnant being on that cross. And for a long time, we're going to see Jesus on the cross wearing that purple, we call it a colobium, a purple robe with golden stripes. And we see... That's a good contrast to the two thieves on either side who are naked except for loincloths, right? And so we have that image. Below, it's kind of wonderful, and the lower section of that panel is an image of the resurrection, the empty tomb. It's kind of, the doors are kind of blowing off the tomb. You can see streams of light coming out of the tomb that are knocking over the, the soldiers. So we have the crucifixion right above the resurrection and the crucifixion already of somebody who is not, in fact, uh, dying. This is another uh, reliquary box. It was something that a pilgrim brought with him or her to the Palestine on a trip and collected little stones from the areas where they visited. So the, these stones are labeled, and they'll say, well, from Bethlehem or from Jordan or from someplace. And we have on the cover of that, or inside cover of this box, are these uh, small images. On the upper left is the resurrection. It's a, hard to explain, but that is actually looks like a spaceship landing, I know, but it's actually a resurrection scene. And then there's the, the image of the ascension. And on the, on the very lower uh, left is the, is the nativity. It's the Bethlehem scene. And on the right is the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan. In the center is that image. Okay, so I gave you a bigger detail of it. Again, you see this image of Jesus in the purple robe with the golden stripes. Vigorous, alive on the cross. And then every time we begin to see more of these images, we see really not Jesus on the cross, but Jesus hovering over it. A bust of Christ above a cross. Actually, it's a cross that pilgrims are venerating. They're kneeling to it. And you see the two bodies of the two thieves are perfectly obvious, but Jesus doesn't have a body on that cross. He's not on that cross. He's, in some sense, looking down upon it. And this is a small lead, oh, probably about as big as a, a former, like a silver dollar used to be, if anybody remembers those. And it's a small lead uh, vial to hold uh, oil, holy oil, brought from the, ho from the Holy Land by a pilgrim, probably oil that was poured over a relic of the cross that they found at the time in Jerusalem. <laughs> 
But I'm just bringing you another one. This one is from the seventh century. It's in Rome. It's in the church, uh, a small round church of Santo Stefano Rotondo. And it's also, again, you see the gemmed cross of triumph with the bust of Christ hovering above it. So we don't have very much crucifixion scenes. We have something different. But this theological message of this art is about glory and triumph and conquest of death through the crucifixion. And this just continues on and on into the Middle Ages. So we have, and then we suddenly get a little bit of a change. We still have a vigorous Christ on the cross, but we ha and it's spilling blood, but he's still, but he, and he doesn't wear the purple colobium any longer, but he has himself looking very alive. This is the first time in Western art we have a dying Jesus on the cross. His eyes are closed, his head is down, his arms are beginning to move up, his body is sagging, you can see the distended stomach, you can see the begin to see the turn of the body on the cross, that little bit of torque. And this is unusual because it's so early. It is nothing like this again for quite a while. There's a miracle story about this. Apparently there was a crack in the head of this and apparently they put a little relic of the cross in the crack, I think, and healed the, the crack. Um, so as we watch the evolution of this image, I'm not gonna be able to talk about what happens in the Orthodox East because it doesn't do this. This is now completely in the West. We're talking about Western early Middle Ages and into the High Middle Ages. And so although that is from Constantinople and this is where we're gonna start to see this kind of change. A beloved disciple over there, looking rather stoic. And this would be typical of what we're going to see continuously in the Eastern iconography. In the West, we begin to see something that looks a little bit different. But this one, we have Jesus practically dancing off the cross. <laughs> I, I, I find that very amusing, actually, because he's sort of looking as if he's about to jump right off. And up above is the image of Jesus' ascension, God's hand coming down in this little, he's standing on the heads of the apostles practically as he's moving up into, into the ascension. And there he is reigning um, from above, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. So I bring you the San Damiano cross, the one that was supposed to have spoken to St. Francis. Again, you see the similarities. He's now not wearing the purple robe. He's now got a loincloth. And that's what it is in place. It's a bad photograph, sorry. But you sort of see this, this into 1200, we're still seeing this kind of scene. And gradually, 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 we begin to see a little bit of grief on the faces of the Virgin and the beloved disciple. Not terrible, it's not disaster. And we still yet, even into, into that 13th century Limoges enameled cross, we still see a reigning king with a purple loincloth this time and a crown on a jammed cross. So what happens? How do we get to the crucifix? Well, that, that we know so well, us in the West, especially in our Catholic schools. Well, this is what happens around the 10th, 11th, 12th century. It has to do with the development of effective piety. Now, I know people will tell me that it has to do with wars and plagues, but I can tell you there always were wars and plagues. So something else has to explain this. It has a little bit to do with the development of a new kind of atonement theory in the West about what crucifixion means, and that is it a payment of Christ making payment for the sins of human beings to an angry God, or I think it's more likely that it has to do with the development of this kind of piety. And so I'm kind of summarizing this for you. I'm gonna hurry this along. Beginning in the 11th century, Prayer began to be addressed most directly to Christ and not mostly to God or jointly to Christ and the, and the Father. It's the atonement theory then shifts to making Christ the satisfaction for human sin rather than a defeat or trickery of the devil. More importantly, I think in all of this, is devotion to Christ is a growing emphasis on the humanity of Jesus and the suffering and the passion, personal and collective. I, we call this effective piety. Imaginative engagement with the crucifixion, especially with the wounds and the blood of Christ and the instruments of the passion. 
So you see this image of this uh, worshiping at the feet of a bleeding and wounded cross who is hanging from this, the tree, hanging from the, 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 the tree with the t themes of the passion, the, the symbols of his passion all around him. And we have these prayers about like St. Anselm of Canterbury, so much as I can, but not so much as I ought. I should be mindful of your passion, your cross, and your wounds, and how you were slain for me, and how you were prepared for burial and buried. And it goes on and on. Why could you not, why could you, and he's speaking to himself, why could you, my soul, not bear to see with horror the blood that poured out from Redeemer's side? This is a completely different shift in the theology of the cross and the crucifixion. And it has everything to do with showing the Christ's love and trying to show your love back for this sacrifice. So we, we, we sort of have all of these kinds of images emerging in the high and late Middle Ages and mostly in the West that dovetails with the atonement theory, the development of atonement theory as it changes to focusing on the suffering of Christ, the payment of death, um, the, the it's complicated to, to explain that, but also the kind of devotion to this image of the dying man. So that did not happen until that time. And these kinds of images then begin to emerge. We emphasize the wound and the, and the various instruments of the passion. You can see them on the left, the, the scourge and the whip and the crown of thorns and the dice being tossed at the feet of Christ on the cross, and over here, the sadness, the wounds, the scarring, the crown of thorns. I mean, the Bible doesn't tell us that Christ wore the crown of thorns all the way to the cross. Now we see it. For the first time, we're going to see it on the body of Christ, on the cross itself. And that's going to be the change. And along with that change, we start to see the mourning family. The mourners, the gathered mourners around, the Virgin Mary sinking and swooned to the ground in suffering and grief can hardly stand up. We have the angels above swirling around, sometimes turning somersaults in agony and fear. Um, we have the whispering of the, of the, of the gathered um, praying Franciscans on their knees, you know, in this image from Giotto, from the cathedral in Assisi. We start to see the rib cage. We start to see the stomach distended. And there we have again the virgin being caught as she's about to sink in grief and in, in, in pass out. Grief and mourning all around. And I'm, I'm losing track of my time, so I'm not sure how much, how much I should keep going. But I'm going to go just a few more slides and we'll stop. So we get these wonderful texts from people like Julian of Norwich, who concentrates in her deathbed and her sickbed on the bleeding of Christ and, and trying to identify with it in her own body. Um, and then this kind of the yeah. devotee looking upon cross, the Christ who's not only carrying now his own cross and wearing his crown of thorns, but displaying his wound, displaying his wound and showing it to you. Do as you look upon this. And if you look upon this, you, you know, there's all kinds of new things that happen with, with uh, indulgences that you know, enough looking on this, enough prayers, you can actually start to work your way out of purgatory in time. So this is all a huge development, all the way to the end. Um, at the time we get to the, almost to the beginning of, of the, the uh, 16th century, early 16th century, and we have um, this very famous painting, which was put in a hospital in, uh, well, it was in Germany, but it's now in Colmar, France, called the Eisenheim Altarpiece. This is the center of, the, of a very complex altarpiece in which uh, people who were then themselves suffering from an illness which made their bodies break out in sores, it was a deadly illness, it was uncurable, could look upon a Christ suffering in somewhat the same way. And that was intended to give them consolation, perhaps even hope, but also the identifying that God was a sufferer with them. God understood their suffering, and so on having undergone something like it. And then everything changes again. 
in a little way, in a certain way. So in the 16th and 17th centuries, we see yet another evolution. And we return to an image which I would call a return to the glorious Christ on the cross. He's still shown as dead, and sometimes even as dying, but the emphasis is on his human beauty rather than his human suffering. It's a sign of his divinity. The wounds and the blood of late medieval passion images are starting to disappear, and what we get instead is this heroic and graceful and brightly colored, triumphant kind of images of Christ. Um, and I'll show you some just to give you the sense of what I'm talking about. So there we are. <laughs> we see this image of Christ on the cross. He's no longer bleeding and suffering in the same way. He's living again on the cross. And very often, he's looking up and not down. His head is not sunk on his chest. His body is not distorted. Well, that's a little distorted only because of the style we call mannerist here in some ways. But this is an image of of beauty, of emphasizing Christ as this heroic figure. And I wanted to give you that so you got a sense of the scale of that painting. I have this, uh, give you how large that is. It's hard to, when a slide comes up, to have a student understand anything about how big these things or how small they might be. Um, and then we get to Peter Paul Rubens, finally the, the quintessential Catholic Reformation painter. And there we have the heroic Christ. I mean, there is a buff Jesus, if there ever was one, <laughs> conquering everything. Um, and so, well, no, I can, the, the image of Jesus in, in, in the, uh, the, um, oh, it's the Immaculate Conception Shrine in Washington, D.C. is probably a little more so. But anyway, that one um, is quite amazing. Um, and we, we also get this image of Christ uh, being elevated up on the cross. Uh, from Rubens as well. See his muscular body, his strength, his power. He's not in any way weak or dying or suffering. This is a muscled Jesus of got to be elevated up on his cross. There's a really good example. And to bring it all around, and let's hope to open up some conversation. I have, I have Professor Janice to thanks for this. We talked about this on the phone, is to compare these two images, one of a Catholic um, artist, uh, early 17th century, again, Rubens, with one that was done afterwards, a little later, by Rembrandt. And Rembrandt is not exactly a Protestant. We don't exactly know what his religious commitments were. As far as we know, he might not have had any, but he w painted a lot of beautiful religious images. And we can think about the differences between these two and how they're alike and how Rembrandt's clearly borrowing some of Rubens' techniques in terms of the way the light works in this painting, the emphasis of using the light, how your eyes drawn into these triangular compositions, but also the fact that he's doing something new with this image over here that Rubens couldn't have, wouldn't have conceived of or wouldn't have wanted to conceive of. And this is a much more vulnerable, older Christ being taken down from the cross recipient, possibly in here in this case, one of his disciples, that's probably Joseph of Arimathea, standing on the left in the church. You can't quite make it out. But the standing, she's still standing on her own two feet. And there's lots of reasons why Rubens painted the Virgin that way and Rembrandt would have painted it this way. But this is where I want to stop and see if I can open up some conversation. Maybe you see things in this that you'd like to, to point out and share. So. So we have about 20 minutes or so for discussion, and if you would, let me bring you the microphone so we can record your question, and uh, I'd, we'd like to begin with a question from a student, uh, if possible. Thank you so much for um, coming to speak today, and I apologize if this question seems um, tangential, but I was just wondering, 
the earlier depictions that we see of the crucified Christ have his, the feet are separated and they're, cr they're crucified by two nails. And that aligns more closely to the traditional Roman method of crucifixion. But as we see, like even on the crucifix in this room here, it transitions to a singular nail and folded feet. Is there a defined reason for this or? Actually, we have, there's, there's lots of new, I'm looking at my colleague over here. She knows more about this than I do, I think. Um, we have good archeological evidence, not really lots of it, but about how crucifixion happened. In fact, it probably was nailed through the ankle onto the cross. So none of these images actually show much of that, except maybe those very early possible ones. And we also don't think that probably the hands probably wouldn't have been nailed. They might have been nailed, but they, that would, itself wouldn't have held a body on the cross. So they probably would have also been bindings holding the arms onto the cross because this would just, you know, your, your wrists and your palms are not strong enough. So in terms of accuracy, you know, literal historical accuracy, probably none of these are correct. We also don't think there was necessarily a, 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 a vertical piece that like went above the cross piece and all kinds of things. Um, the, the, the one nail, two nail crosses is a really interesting, and I'm trying to remember, it becomes a heresy to have two nails at one point. <laughs> I can't remember why, and it's a big discussion. You can actually Google this. It's a big controversy about that, but I think we see that happening, the crossed feet, later in the imagery. Yeah, it comes up quite a bit later. I should say it's only in the Gospel of John that we're talking, the nails are even described, as in, and that's only in the story of the Downing Thomas. Thank you so much. Um, there's a mosaic in Ravenna uh, that I really am struck by, and uh, it's kind of Christ, and he's he looks like a Roman emperor, and he's victori victoriously holding the cross over his shoulder like a wet. Yeah, and um, I I'm fascinated by that depiction, but I'm equally fascinated by how it's that same sort of scene is represented in other places. There's a Stuttgart Psalter from around 820 that has this so almost the same scene except in contemporary dress. And he's standing, uh, one foot is on top of a lion, the other's on top of a serpent. And then in the dream of the root or the, the, uh, uh, the that contains part of the poem, sorry, this is breaking up. Um, question to do with how these sort of iconographical depictions, how do they travel? Would someone have gone and seen that and then written down instructions? What do we know about how these patterns travel over time, over geography? The, the image that, that you are describing um, in Ravenna, there's, there's actually two of them that I can think of. One is a very famous mosaic, much restored, but we can trust it, I think, pretty well, of Jesus dressed in military garb. So he's a, he's a, he's a soldier, or a, a general, maybe, and he's, uh, wear, so he's wearing the, the breastplate and the, you know, I forget what you call the little tunic-y thing, with the lappets on it, and boots, and he's got a cross over his shoulders, and he's stomping on a lion, or a, what is probably a basilisk or something, and a serpent or something, and it's from a psalm. I forget what psalm it is. I can, somebody can help me. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Well, and he's got a, I am the way, the truth, and the life on his hands, but it's, a, it's the I will trample on the adder and the basilisk and so forth. So it's a reference to that again, the kind of victory of the Messiah. Um, and there's also a version of that in stucco in the Orthodox baptistry as well. Um, and, it, and you see versions of it into the Middle Ages. I, actually, I almost brought you that image because I was trying to think of that. And there's one where he's actually in the Middle Ages where he's actually taking the cross and he's banging the devil on the head with it. So um, I don't know how much they travel. I mean, I think you could think about that as a kind of military image. Christus militans is what it's often called. But it's often also an image of triumph. Um, and something else you asked about, and I'm now I'm forgetting. Um, the... Oh, the dream of the root, yeah. Well, the dream of the root is completely unique, I think, in some ways, because it's an Irish hero. But the hero of that story is also, of course, Christ, but it's also the cross itself. 
And so it's, this, the, it's, a, it's a great text, and I hope that somebody will read it along there in some of the early English classes. But it's, if you know the text, it's, the, it's the, the cross tells its side of the story. And it tells about the young hero climbing up, you know, you know, in, in, you know, completely voluntarily and throwing himself on the cross, and it's the two of them together, and it's kind of like the hero and his sidekick sort of story. Um, and that's actually quite wonderful. Um, there, are, there are interesting versions of the cross telling its story elsewhere in the history of Christianity, and I could probably send you some of the references, but the cross gets a voice and gets a story of its own. And in some ways, the cross also gets detached a little bit from the passion story, um, and it becomes the sign of Christ. And in Matthew 23, I think it's where the, you know, the, he's coming again in glory and his sign will precede him. And everybody then begins to think, that, well, that has to be the cross. So at the, I laugh because if I was at Notre Dame, I'd start with a different image. And I'd start with the image in the ceiling of our basilica in the Lady Chapel. And it's, you know, in sp uh, space unica, you know, our only hope. And it's the cross coming out of the sky. And the person, and the two figures at the bottom, I always ask my students, and they never know who it is. You know, there's, there's a female and male at the very bottom of this wonderful painting, and they just assume it's the Virgin Mary and you know, Joseph or something. <laughs> no, no, it's the Empress Helena and the Bishop Macarius of Jerusalem. <laughs> They're going, what? <laughs> anyway, so there's that sense of the, the cross coming again in glory. Could I ask a, a quick question? You brought us up to the early 1600s. If you had a uh, if, could you give us a short, maybe, what did the last 400 years look like up to today? Well, in, in the, I, I taught a class on this last semester, and I ended <laughs> with a sort of where we are with the cross itself and the controversies over the cross. Because, I mean, if you could think about what the cross means in terms of the Crusades, you can think, I mean, how terrifying it might have been. Um, the cross in terms of the Ku Klux Klan and the burning of crosses. We talked about the cross um, in China and the controversies over the cross. I opened the book with the story of the cross at Ground Zero. Um, there's this two girders that were intersected that were left and the rubble of the, the World Trade Tower buildings and is now in the museum. And there was a lot of controversy about that as a, in a public museum. Um, so I think it's much more complicated. Um, African Americans thinking about the cross and the lynching tree, James Cohn's book. And then, I mean, we even have some instances of women on the cross. Uh, so there's cases of Krista and Christina and some others of her sisters on the cross, a feminist commentary on the suffering and abuse of women, perhaps. And sometimes that complicates the story even more about what the cross is trying to tell us and what the scene of the crucifixion. So in the last 200 years, um, it's, kind of, it's kind of all over the map. And I think um, also with the, um, what I find very interesting is um, having grown up in a Protestant household, um, the, the evolution of hymnody, which emphasizes the blood and the cross, but a kind of, Oh, and I want to say reticence about having an image of it. <laughs> so you can have it in words. You can sing about the old rugged cross. You can sing about there's power in the blood. You can do all of this stuff, but you don't make an image of it. It's the same way. And the, and the argument is always you don't want to leave him on the cross. You need to get him off the cross because we want to go right to the resurrection. You want to skip past Good Friday as fast as possible and get right to Easter Sunday. And that's where we as Protestants and Catholics have to talk about why we do this differently and what it means to us to have the crucifix, not just the empty cross. Thanks so much. Really interesting. Um, I missed the first five minutes, so if you answered this question then, I'll be very embarrassed. But um, up till the middle of the fourth century, I think, including on the tombstones, I saw a lot of birds. And after that, I saw angels. And I've never thought about that. I've never noticed birds. I'm wondering, were angels a replacement for birds? And why were there birds in the first place? <laughs> 
Well, birds are really, really favorite images for Romans to start with. <laughs> so birds are all over the catacomb paintings, and they're all over mosaics. And peacocks are especially popular because they're really beautiful. Um, they're supposed to be a symbol of resurrection, but I think the, te the evidence for that is kind of slim. But anyway, we say that, um, and they're just great, so we like them anyway. Um, and we do shift to angels, and by the time you get into the 5th century, the angels will be holding that Christogram, that Cairo symbol in a wreath. It'll have flying angels. Now, I, what I have to tell you is that those angels, if we think about women in long white dresses with wings, those are our angels. You know, th that's actually victory, or Nike. That's actually the goddess. But she's the goddess of victory, so it works. <laughs> well, we just Christianize her. We just baptize that figure and turn her into a Christian angel. Um, and, and so, yeah, that's great. Um, and I think there's a, it's even a better symbol in some ways of, of victory and conquest. Thanks. Um, thank you very much. I, <clears throat> I have two questions which I think are united in their root in a way. So one of the interesting things that you pointed out was the emergence of this wreathed Cairo after Constantine. And it seems like it's, it's one of the things that it's doing is it's a symbol of, it's kind of an imperial legitimation symbol. And it, when you chronicled the departure of Western depictions from the Byzantine depictions, I wonder if there's anything that we see happening in the West that's different from the East that would correlate with the failure of Roman power in the West, that you might have traditions continue in the East that are linked to that kind of Constantinian program that you would not necessarily have in the West. And then with respect to the other piece that you that was so interesting, but that this the suffering Christ depiction, which you which you related both to a movement in devotion and also to a kind of a theological shift in soteriology or atonement theory, I I take it those are complementary aspects of a single kind of cultural development in your reading of this thing. So let me start with the imperial. So the question was, I think you heard it, but it's about this uh, Constantinian symbol. And it clearly is an imperial monogram. I mean, but it's also connected to, to Christ. So it's a very interesting one. And Constantine supposedly put it on the, over the ceiling of the entrance to his palace in Constantinople. So it carries on in the East for a long time. Although, actually, Justinian begins to show just a cross and his coinage. So it does change a little bit. Um, so when, by the time we get to the 6th century, it's beginning to eclipse a little even in the East. And in the West, shortly by the time we get to the beginning, end of the 4th and beginning of the 5th century, it's not showing up in the coinage of the Roman emperors in the West anymore, Magnentius and Decentius, these usurpers, so-called emperors, maybe the last ones to really put it prominently on their coins. And I think what happens is it just, but it becomes absolutely a sign for a, fu a funerary marker. So we see it in North Africa in tomb mosaics. We see it in, in the West in marble and limestone tomb markers. We see it with doves holding olive branches. And then we see this. When I think there's something funny. I can show you this. I, I always try to get my students to look at this and think this is quite funny because I don't think that people in the West always understood what it was after a while. Here. What do you think about the Alpha and the Omega in both of these? Markers. So I think, especially in this one, sometimes I don't think these Latin speakers knew what that was. I think it, it loses its imperial valence in the West pretty a little longer. And the second question you asked, now I'm forgetting, I'm going to... Um, uh, there's a lot of synergy between the atonement theory and this devotional practice, but there's also a distinction. And I want to make, I think I'm feeling very strongly more and more all the time about that, because you'd find the same thing in Abelard as you'd find in Anselm. So um, you can have different atonement theories of, in that mi medieval West. They both emphasize the love of Christ on the cross and our, our 
our salvation by returning that love. Um, and Julian of Norwich, I don't think, is working with an atonement theory so much as a personal effective piety. So I do think they're connected, but I don't want to make them completely overlapping. And it'd be so hard to explain various atonement theories in the West. I decided not to try to do it in this lecture. But, but it really is something for my students at Notre Dame who are not theology majors, they don't know that there are other atonement theories. They've only ever heard one. And so I'm trying to introduce them to all of these others. And I think as a teacher of, of, of this theology, I find it really works beautifully to use this iconography to help them to see it. Dr. Jensen, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. It's really been visually rich and uh, yeah, matter for contemplation. I'm really fascinated by um, your connection of the atonement theory and effective piety, a shift in a theological vision um, influencing the art. And I'm pondering about the writings of St. Paul where it seems very clearly that there is in the early church an understanding of redemptive suffering and union with Christ in suffering. Um, First Colossians, you know, or Colossians chapter one at least. I, I'm wondering if there's... Um, if these Christian artists, um, in a way, are responding to the social imagination of the early church, where they felt a need to distance images of the cross and crucifixion from the brutality that they likely would have experienced, because the presence of crucifixion is very different in the early church than um, certainly in the 11th and 12th century when we start to see a little bit more of the suffering Christ. So have, in your research, have you touched on that? One of the things that I, I try to say is that, you know, in answering the question, and, and I struggle with it, I don't know the answer, is why we have so little crucifixion imagery in the early church. Um, I don't have an adequate answer for that and because it's not missing in the text. I mean, it's all over the writings. And clearly, people were, I mean, we had Good Fridays before we had Easter Sunday as a liturgy, right? So, in fact, I was laughing and thinking, this should be, you know, this should be Good Friday and not Advent. But anyway, um, so, so I think it's not about, and, and, you know, Christians were not constantly persecuted. And they also lived in a world of, of violent games and also sorts of glory, glorification of brutality. We have a little bit of crucifixion imagery that's not Christian, very few graffito and those kinds of things, graffiti and those kinds of things. But I think, I think it might have been, well, one simple answer I don't know if I like is that there was no model for it. You can't make something in art until you have a model for it. Well, I, we do it all the time. We always make the first one, but um, there wasn't quite a model for it, um, or people didn't like to see something like it. They certainly didn't, they certainly weren't reticent about talking about it. So it doesn't quite, that this is where a text and art disconnect for me. I'm not sure if this is an answer to your question, but I, um, it's a social world in which for Romans to be uh, subjected to a humiliating death like crucifixion was, um, was a terrible scandal and shame. It was a shaming, shaming thing. And for Christians to lionize this, it sort of turns the whole thing over. But Paul's already saying that. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about how clear it is already in Paul that this is an overturning of your expectations and it's a scandal and a stumbling block. But then we go for it. You know, we do it because it happened, right? So we're going to make some, some meaning from that. What's the meaning you make from it? Joan. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, uh, for others here, we've been in conversation about much of this for 20 years now, and I just want to say this was beautifully illustrated and so um, richly presented. Um, the, the transformation of an object of capital punishment, by the, a Roman object um, of death, into a symbol of victory over death, uh, absolutely compelling, and, and I really appreciated it. I do have a question just um, because, as you pointed out, in the fourth century, we really are <laughs> seeing these transformations 
take place. So my question is, um, do you feel that the victory wreath is necessary for that to happen? Because initially you talked about um, the cross being held by Jesus as a scepter, but not yet related to victory over death symbol. Whereas I would say it's already there. there. So that's my question. No, I, th I think when he's holding that cross, I think that is also what it is. I, I'm sorry, I should, maybe I glided over that. I would agree with you on that. Um, the wreath is really interesting to me. Um, and you see in so many of these images, and let me see if I can find this one. Um, you see wreaths being held over the heads of all of those apostles, even as they're moving towards the center wreath. And so the giving of a wreath, of course, many of you know this, is the, what you give to the martyr, is what you give to the, the conquering, the one who will be resurrected immediately, or not resurrected, but going immediately to heaven. Body still stays here. But anyway, um, so the idea of the wreath, and then we see this wreath symbol also, um, not just given to saints and martyrs and apostles, but we see it given to the newly baptized. So often in um, a symbol uh, like, uh, you know, there'll be a, in, in, in Naples, there's a wonderful baptistry from the early fifth century. And at the very apex, right over the baptismal font, is the Christogram. And God's holding a hand with a wreath out to the one who's standing in the font below. So I think the wreath is all part of the same imagery of, of resurrection, of rebirth, of new life, of victory over death. Um, and it's, it's, it is also the, the gift you give to the one who's going to be uh, the saint. Um, and so they're often holding their wreaths, right? And there's many images of the saints carrying their wreaths, and so that's what it all means. So I think, the, I'm not sure if that's an answer or, or just an elaboration, but yeah, thanks. We have time, I think, for one more question this afternoon. And just as a quick reminder, please do join us uh, at the conclusion of this afternoon's event in the great room for our reception uh, to continue this conversation. Thank you so much, Doctor, for joining us today. <clears throat> I have a question about the development of Eastern art. I know you, you said you want to skip over that a little bit in your lecture, but I'm just curious to know, like you were talking about, for instance, the influence of theology and development of theology on the change of Western art. And then also I'd imagine certain historical events, like how has Eastern art developed and differentiated itself over these past I think you made the cutoff point around the year 1000. So how has, just a very, very briefly, like what? A, the question is how is the Eastern different from the West? How, recently, since the split, how has it differentiated itself or how has that grown? Um, a, a couple of things. One is that um, in terms of atonement theory, I'll start with that. One of the things that an Eastern Orthodox theologian would always want to remind us is that you, want, you don't want to separate the crucifixion from either the incarnation or the resurrection. <laughs> this is all of one piece. So I think they often worry that the Western theology stops, you know, when they make the linkage between incarnation and resurrection. Um, and so that said, um, one of the, you know, so um, one of the arguments that happened in this, right about the time of the split between the two, um, was whether uh, the, the East was, was attempting to show a dead and dying Christ on the cross. And they said, no, 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 we don't, we don't do that. Because we don't want to suggest that God is dying either. So it, it, there's a whole theological argument about whether the divine nature of Christ could die, the human nature of Christ, you know, and on and on. And it gets very complicated. But I think that um, for the East, there's much less effort to show the suffering and dying Christ on the cross. I think they would tend to emphasize the idea that this is uh, only part of the story, not suggest that, that Christ is dying, both in human and human. That's a tricky part. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. Please join me in thanking our guest. Thank you.